it's prime time hacking this. Okay, we're ready. Welcome back to Campus Party 2013 on the Galileo stage. Next up, we have B. Farake Takor, who will be giving a speech on our space in the universe. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please can I round the applause for B? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is B. Takor. And I'm here to represent one of the largest space advocacy and citizen science organizations, the Planetary Society. We're on a mission to help citizen scientists all around the world discover our place in space. And I want to tell you why you should be involved and how. So the story of humanity, the story of humanity so far is a story of ideas. Ideas with the power of grasping civilizations. Ideas that have spurred great quests of origin and transcendence. Scientific ideas that have helped us unravel mysteries. Ideas that we've embraced rationally and irrationally. Ideas for which we have lived and died, killed and been killed for. Ideas that unite us and divide us, and ideas that we hold true universally around the bonds that bind us. These ideas have resulted in every moment in human history, every love song, every eureka moment, every technological breakthrough, all happened here. Every laugh, every tear, here, here, and here. So when we look at this view of our world and our existence, it, is, it very quickly hits home that we live on a fragile island of, of life in a universe of possibilities. And these possibilities really came to fruition on Earth in a very short time. Our planet has spent the vast majority of 4.56 billion years developing and nurturing life, not waiting for its uh, emergence. Life happened very quickly and that bodes well for the potential of life elsewhere in the cosmos. The other thing that one should take away from this chart is that, a very that, that there is a very narrow range of time over which humans can claim to be the dominant intelligence on the planet. It's only in the last few hundred thousand years um, modern humans have been able to pursue technology and civilization. So one needs a very deep appreciation of the diversity and incredible scale of life as the first step in understanding our own space, place in space. In my view, we're not the pinnacle of evolution but we are one outcome of a very rich tree of possibilities. We are that speck of dust that through finding problems and solving them through adaptation and evolution has started enough to wonder where did we come from? And this has constantly led us, led us to learn that we're just a very, very small part of our cosmical evolution. Our mission at the Planetary Society is to aid and support our continued participation in this evolution by knowing our world better, getting to know the worlds around us, and helping answer two very profound questions. Where did he come from? And are we alone? We know now that the building blocks of life come from dying stars, resulting in there being elements of life equally spaced in the universe, more and more of these life-generating bonds of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, are being introduced into the galaxy every few millennia. And that's, given the scale of the universe, is, is like us saying something happens every day. But so with some 100 billion galaxies out there, there are abundant possibilities for life to exist. Closer to home, the study of extremophiles on Earth that live and thrive in places in 
deep sea devoid of sunlight in adverse con conditions in thermal winds, frozen in ice, or in cooling winds of nuclear reactors, have all told us that life can organize in many ways in our vast universe, in more ways than we initially thought was possible. SETI and the search of um, extraterrestrial intelligence and the Kepler mission have identified several candidates of objects on which life of some sort is possible and they are dotted around in our vast universe. So that brings me to a little bit about SETI. Looking at a world as a tiny dot on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy does make you wonder, what if there are others out there that are looking at the same stars in the night sky from the other side of the galaxy and asking the same questions? Would the discovery of a distant civilization with a comic cosmic origin finally offer a way for us all as human beings to bond? It's certainly a wish worth trying. It is this idea that I first came to learn and participate within the Planetary Society. Planetary Society seeded SETI. And a lot of you may be aware of this particular screen slaver, which was really a part of the SETI project um, named SETI at Home. And it introduced me to a vast range of passionate advocates that form many arms of the society's activities today. You should all be familiar with one such. And SETI seeks to answer these very, very profound questions, trying to attribute a possibility or even a probability to the existence of life and intelligent life there, there too. SETI uses the tools of astronomy to try and find evidence of someone else's technology out there. Our own technologies are visible in the in interstellar distances and theirs might as well be. So SETI has scouted the skies for over 50 years and brought together a community of citizen scientists that have helped us discover what a blueprint of life that may have existed before us looks like. It is said that you, tru you never really know yourself truly until you can um, see yourself through someone else's eyes. And imagine this looking at our own civilization from the eyes of another life form somewhere far away in another galaxy. So the power of this question is so important that it has been a force that has galvanized um, technologies and intelligence that we collectively possess. I started working with the Planetary Society and SETI in 1999, and I recall at that point, it was hard to believe that about 300,000 computers were even connecting to the internet, but these were actively engaged in the search for SETI signals, and some 1,100 years of CPU processing time was being um, devoted to this process. Now, there is another very... Now, this is really important to look at it, at these figures, because now these numbers would be dwarfed by the, the type of technology that is present around us. One thing that SETI did not collectively do was use another power that we have in abundance, and that, that is our distributed brain power. But through SETI, um, and since then, the society has been able to extend its involvement in helping citizen scientists explore life on, on other planets. Starting in 1990, um, Mars offered endless opportunities um, for citizen science to adopt some of the same participation model as SETI and gather some really unique perspectives. So I want to start by showing you this, and please bear with me as I try and just make the animation work. <laughs> But this is a panorama stitched together by Domia Buik. Domia is one of the amateur citizen scientists, as we call, <laughs> call them, from France. He's been working with a project that we funded and um, supported called unmanspaceflight.com. Uh, it's a group that um, would allow anyone to take images that have been captured by Mars rovers and process them and share them back with the, 
the actual teams that are doing scientific missions with these rovers or actually helping, um, helping scientists navigate the surface of Mars. So Damia became the first individual to have seen this panorama that was taken by the MASTCAM 34 from Curiosity rover on Sol 50, which in Earth date is 26th of September last year. He did the same for the day after, the, the Sol after, and he did the same every single day until he was able to actually um, look through and walk around the surface of Mars. So there is some incredibly unique perspectives that citizen sciences are, scientists are bringing to us. Well, it all started with Mars, but that has been a great uh, uh, destination to attract huge amounts of interest from citizen scientists and has been an important destination in our journey to engage, involve and inspire to the maximum so that future generations can actually experience walking on Mars someday. Several other programs have, have used these tools now to build further um, avenues where U.S. citizen scientists can get involved. Um, so here is um, Count Craters, which is a I Am a Martian project by NASA. Um, Planet 4, which is actually run by Zooniverse, um, which is a, a UK project based out of Oxford. So I really encourage and hope that you would, um, after today, log on to these and, and engage with these projects firsthand. Citizen scientists have also helped us answer some very serious scientific questions and provided vital data to the Astronomical Society and have discovered thousands of objects, including nebulae, supernova, and gamma ray bursts. Citizen science and art collaborations have helped gather unique experiences from listening to the symphony of the LIDAR altimeter um, on Kaguya Selene, which is a JAXA lunar probe, or listening to alien sandstorms, thunder, and the pattern of patter of methane rain, or the crash or splash of a landing from all the way to Mars to Titan. So I just want to point out a couple of things. In the middle, you'll see a little microphone um, circuit, and that was actually sent by the Planetary Society um, on a mission to Mars, and we were able to get sound recordings back, um, transmitted back. And similarly, there was a microphone on um, the Cassini Huygens um, probe that went to Titan. So we have been able to collect some very unique insights to experience what life would be like on, on further planets than we really stepped foot on. Our platform for citizen science begs further scale and depth now that technologically we have much better tools. It is important to mention um, and, and thank the thousands of volunteers who helped us and helped fund these initiatives, actively taking part in our advocacy and shaping our strategy to these distant destinations. But still, we have much more to do. Building on the environment that has been opened by the data sets from different missions, there is still one challenging aspect of our neighborhood that really begs your creative insight, asteroids well known for bringing life and also for destroying it. We're too busy playing computer games, being angry at bad piggies, rather than actually actively detecting and classifying what could be really bringing doom our way. We're trying to understand how life exists and can flourish on different planets by deliberately even sending life into interstellar space, into onto Mars, um, onto the moon, and here are a couple of examples. Um, the life biomodule experiment that has been running um, at the Planetary Society has been actively framed by citizen scientists. You can see the shuttle life experiment in the, um, uh, space, uh, so in, in the International Space Station and a biomodule that um, we're trying to deliberately send to Mars. Another way in which um, we can understand what life really needs, whether it is to exist on asteroids, whether to travel with asteroidal um, environments, or whether it is the d threat and danger of asteroids coming our way. 
Um, we also offer Shoemaker Neo grants, which can be um, uh, which can be won by anyone who is a citizen science scientist and is engaged in citizen science and we also help the dawn mission where you can actually actively help detect craters classify them and help us understand asteroidal um, shapes and sizes i'd like to just take one um moment to just go through a couple of our very, very recent projects that have been shaped and funded by citizen scientists. And one of them has been the ARCID 100 Space Telescope, which is the first privately funded space telescope, and the second stage of which is actually to go and mine an asteroid. Now, this is where 17,000 people came along uh, together and could pour enough funding and support into this mission to make it possible. If, if this were to be carried out by any um, governmental or intergovernmental body, the budget here would actually be very minuscule for even the project to take off. I suppose our biggest challenge and our biggest um, ultimate project so far is, has been the light sail too. Um, this is a solar sail project where we're using photons and the, and the light from the sun to travel interstellar distances. It has been funded by our, our members and citizen scientists, and we have actually had citizen scientists shape the actual um, building and the technology within it. From people sending in origami uh, structures all the way to people helping us understand uh, prototyping by sending small sails off to sort of hail balloons and um, see them floating across Boston. So in, in essence, I want to really ask you to get involved. The first step is really to tap into the Global Brain Trust and to build an environment where the raw data that has been brought back by missions can really be accessed and manipulated New algorithms can be developed to really improve the way we are analyzing um, these data sets being sent back from missions and old algorithms made more efficient. It is a technologically very creative challenge and this would change the perspective in which we operate in our daily affairs. I think we'd like to augment the automated search both for life, for features, for understanding of the local universe that we live in, the neighborhood around us, so that we can um, really take human insight into the equation and develop it further. We'd like to use the pattern recognition that has been um, the, the key tool that citizen scientists bring for our projects and really take it further so that we can make it much more faster for Damien Bouik and others like him to really understand how it is to walk around on Mars, not wait 50 soul dates um, whilst doing it. And of course, I personally would like to um, engage and inspire the next generation. It wouldn't be very, it wouldn't be um, true for me to speak at the Women in Technology uh, Day here by not mentioning that these are the tools that would really help the next generation get a completely different perspective on life than we have been brought up with. I would like that students can access this information, get creative with it, and my ask to you is really get involved. Take part in not only our, the projects that exist, but also help us really take a proportion of the three billion hours that are currently being invested in playing computer games. Um, you know, there is a huge variety of, of work that we can do together and like to invite you to make that possible. With that, I really want to thank you for your time. I'd like to invite any questions you have. We are actually um, organizing a night on Mars next week on the, at the National Maritime Museum at 8 o'clock, which includes um, our own participation in the uh, perspectives of the Univisions of the Universe exhibition and like to invite you all to be there. So again, I'd like us all not to be 
that speck of dust that wishes that they were better, but actually be able to really discover our place in space. I hope you will come and join us at the Planetary Society. And if there is any questions on how to do so, there is uh, a few quick links here, and I'll be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Hi. Hi. In your opinion, are we or are we not alone in the universe? <laughs> so, in my opinion, as I said, we do live on only sort of human existence or life on Earth is really one leaf in a very rich um, array of possibilities. What we do know that if anything that SETI finds signals, say for example, um, that would be a civilization that existed a very long time ago. Now, a lot of people actually say SETI is the archaeology of astronomy. So the reason for that, um, let's, let's make this practical, um, the closest star to us, the closest galaxy to us, is 2.5 million light years away. So the light from there takes 2.5 million years to reach us. If we do detect a signal of life and civilization that reaches us, that would have taken many millions of years to get here. And that means that by the time we actually correspond back with it, that may not exist. But what it would do, certainly, is give us a very clear idea of what blue blueprint of technological advancement looks like in a civilization that is able to send signals into stellar distances. So, in my opinion, um, if we're talking about life in general as DNA or sort of even, you know, primordial fluid, that possibly does exist in many places in the universe. If we're talking about intelligence li intelligent life, very unlikely at the moment for us to know. But, um, yeah, so that's my opinion. Um, hello, I have a question. Do you think uh, we should terraform uh, the planets we encounter? Sorry, if I, if I just yeah, caught sure. that correctly, is, it, is your question, do you, I think if we should terraform? Yeah, the planets we encounter. Now, th that's a very, very debatable view in you know it's it's a very um, emotionally excitable question actually now my personal view is that we ought to explore planets we ought to understand um, because they will tell tell us a lot more about sort of where we came from what we should be doing to really live better on this planet we must first understand how to live better with earth and then explore however when it comes to terraforming there is a very, very difficult question. One is, could life ever exist there and would terraforming hence really cause it to be influenced in another way? And is it our rock to be able to go and put a house on it? You know, that's very simplistic terms. That's what it comes down to. Um, I do think that there are certain bodies in the, in the solar system that we know that life cannot exist and it would be fine to terraform them, them, <laughs> there, those destinations. So the moon would be one. Um, but I would suspect it is very hard to say whether one is, um, you know, right to terraform somewhere like Titan, for example, which we know it has the right conditions for life to exist, although in a different form than what we know as life. That's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we humans have been very aggressive uh, in the past and even now we are very aggressive. So I think that will not stop us to, um, to how to say, to colonize other uh, living planets, let's say. Mm. You, you're very right. We have been very aggressive. But I think this is what I was trying to bring out when I showed the geological clock. And I'd just like to sort of turn back to it. But it's... We are, so, personal experience. Um, I've been to the Cayman Islands to dive to understand some of the, the shells that we find that actually are from little, um, uh, one can call them sort of just sea urchin type creatures. These sea urchin type creatures arrived on Earth sort of some, you know, two billion years ago or some such. <laughs> 
Um, and they have actually recorded geological information, lunar patterns, and actually the formation of the moon on their surfaces. Now, these creatures have learned to live life on Earth in a much more better balance than we have. And, and I do think that it is really important for us to understand sort of where we are on that geological scale. We're very aggressive. Well, we're certainly not the most evolved of all, all uh, living beings. So it is true that our instincts are to really go and colonize, or perhaps maybe a better way of, of um, representing the, the motivation is that we want to utilize the resources elsewhere. And that could lead to sort of the, the kind of question of terraforming. However, it's incredibly difficult to sustain life in these highly, highly hostile places um, where, you know, sort of the, the actual um, dangers of radiation from the sun are so high. There could be possibly bombardment of micrometeoroids that we're not protected from because of the lack of atmosphere. So, again, I think humans should explore. They should go and uh, perhaps for extended periods of time live, but they need to have a respect for the type of environment that we really are influencing. That will certainly be influencing, but if we simply go in to really... Um, and there, there probably are better technological answers than we know. That, that's where I think our investment should be in terms of helping us get there. Okay. Great question. Hi. Uh, Hi. I was wondering, you mentioned that, uh, well, or you suggested that people should stop playing games and come to you, <laughs> yeah? Right? So, so my question is basically, have you thought about, because the American military, they do this, they put things into games, yeah. riddles, and then people solve them, and therefore you have automatically a solution. So have you thought about that, and how you could involve, for example, children to place, because they think outside the box. They're not formed by society the same way as we are, yeah. so they are more uh, curiosity, they, they are thinking in another way. So have you, in, in your organization, been thinking about uh, how to attract this kind of uh, people? Fantastic question. So let me just clarify. I didn't mean we should all stop playing games. I just think there is a good proportion, a fraction of the time that is currently being invested in, in perhaps, um, you know, sort of being, being really um, attacking bad piggies. Um, <laughs> nothing against that particular game. But um, I think there, there are three billion hours that are currently being invested in playing mobile games. And you're very right that um, wouldn't it be great to gamify the, the sort of idea of uh, space science and space exploration, classification of different features, for example. And there have been attempts. So there are apps that we have helped develop which allow you to play a game. Um, in fact, um, Planet Hunters does this really well. Um, one of our projects that we um, started um, has helped actually discover new exoplanets, and that's one of the areas of um, application of such gamification. But I think there is a huge amount of potential still to be done. We, are, we do have a new... Um, area of activity that invites and it attracts students to really um, create games. But what we find is across the world, there there are varied levels of, of um, programming knowledge that schools provide at the moment, which is why I'm really asking this audience, the campusarios here, to really help take that message. Because these data sets are open for anyone. And what we really want is not just one or two organizations around the world making these, but really just everyone trying a hand at it. And, and perhaps there are different ways in, in um, sort of manipulating this data that even we haven't thought of. So we have a start point, but I really think that this effort needs scale and depth. Can I have a round of applause for B, please? Thank you very much. Next up, at 3 o'clock, we have Hans Pedder and a talk on 3D printing. There will be a 3D printer present. So if you're interested in 3D printing, please return at 3 p.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>